Welcome back again to the On Deck Circle Podcast. I am your host, Nick Zanaboni. And Jason, we have another threesome this, this evening. Bob Osgood from many different places. But Bob, welcome. Where, If you want to plug some stuff now before we get into the nitty gritty, please do so. Yeah. Uh, thank you both for having me on. This is great. Um, I am working at Over the Monster these days, which is a Red Sox website, uh, you know, doing some writing there. And then we have a weekly podcast that's uh, it's part of a called the Monsters of Sox feed. Uh, our podcast is called The Red Seat. It's myself, Jake Devereaux and Keaton DeRocher. Um, and, you know, I got my start at the Dynasty Guru. I still contribute there now and then, but I've, I've shifted. Uh, I'm still playing a ton of fantasy baseball, but writing about that less and more uh, doing Red Sox content now. Um, and of course, most importantly, a member of the 30 Rock Dynasty Baseball League with both of you, uh, where we've made some great connections and have quite a few laughs throughout the year. So that should have been first and foremost. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Well, it's nice to have another Red Sox fan here because I'm usually the only one that's defending it. I don't know if you've seen my Red Sox luchador mask. Oh, that should have come out. Uh, we talk socks. I have a luchador mask. Okay. I'll put it on. Anyway. Is that going to happen tonight? Um, it might. Yes. Okay. Yes, might. it should. Um, it yeah. should. There's not much to defend these days, Nick, so it must be a tough all. job that you have. <laughs> <laughs> so – we have this thing called the cold open question of the week, Bob. I'm going to tell you exactly what that is now. I'm going to ask a question. Then our intro is going to play, and you need to answer the question. As soon as the intro is over, we'll do a, round, a, a three-way, a triangle of that. Yes, we will. Question. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if you watched the TV show Love is Blind, Bob. Is that in your – It's been in the background in my home <laughs> from time yes, to time. Okay. So you understand yeah. the concept. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking to someone on the other side of a wall. In this most recent season, someone said, who's your celebrity lookalike? And this girl said Megan Fox. Bob does not look like Megan Fox. (laughs) What baseball player would you say that you slightly resemble? Ready, set, go. So, uh, <laughs> Zach Who? Zach oh. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Jason? Now, oh. my oh. hair used to be blonder. So I think early in the career, uh, okay. I got that a lot more. That's fair. Uh, I, I also lost it when the popsicle popped up there. So <laughs> I'm glad yeah. that you guys have that in the intro and you look a lot more like yourself now, Nick. So, yeah. I'm um, <laughs> ready to go. This is yeah. ready to roll, Bob. Jason, this is the transition we've been waiting for. The lo- what, what did we call you? What your name is like? It was like uh, I don't remember. So- Socks Luchador or some I don't forgot. But the first few names were slightly offensive. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got. Like, I don't even know, man. I, I'm maybe like a, like a little bit old school, like Mark DeRosa or something. I'm not even sure. All right. Um, mine's just Joe Kelly. Oh yeah, that's yeah, yeah. You yeah, are, it's yeah. Like not even. It's the easiest Jake question. Devereaux is with. Jake Berger, though, and I say it every time, and he gets so mad at me about it. Why? Um, I don't know. Just, yeah. Like, he's a good-looking yeah, guy. Stud. Yeah. yeah. He he. If if Jake has a mustache, he is Jake Berger. Right. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm gonna like. We could do this with the majority of that that Thirty Rock League, but I feel like I need to. A night of pen and paper to come up with so. <laughs> pen, paper, and a bottle of whiskey. Or something. <laughs> we can figure anything out. All right, I need to take this off because I can't. Oh, see. all right, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. While you're taking that off, let's take care of some housekeeping here at the top of the uh, episode. Here, um, 
let me talk about some business here while I get my my letter or my uh, text read here. Do you want to get access to the most accurate fantasy baseball rankings according to fantasy pros? A draft cheat sheet, which I've been having taking a huge advantage of right now with all these drafts going on. Um, we got DFS betting projections. You can get custom league advice on our Discord and a ton more by signing up to become an all access membership today. You can do so by going to fantasy6pack.net forward slash plans. And right now we have a promo code running. If you use the promo code F6PMLB24, you can save an extra 15% off. I had to fly through that because we, we got to guess now. We don't need to be talking about too much in depth with all that, um, all that business talk. But like I said, cheat cheat it's because it is the basically heart of draft season which i was actually shocked to realize we are less than 30 days away from opening day because that weird two game series at the end of march not even the end of march like the middle of march um it's crazy we only have like three weeks those first two games start i don't know if i'm gonna even be able to finish my tgfbi league by that time because the rate that we're going but it is the heart of draft season, so I think it's time to maybe discuss some just overall draft strategies. We kind of some review some of the drafts that we're in right now, the beginnings of our TGFBI leagues, things like that. Um, seems apropos for this time of year. Yeah, how are you guys looking in terms of pace in those TGFBI leagues? Are you moving along? No. Nope. no. Yeah, I've made <laughs> two. I'm I'm pick thirteen, so I'm. Not quite the turn, but I'm close enough to the turn where, like, uh, you know, you make two picks a day. As I think I'm, is what I'm at right now. A little bit more because we've what's been going for, well, seven, not quite seventy two hours, but fifty something hours, sixty something hours, and I've made six picks. So, yeah, so that's unacceptable. <laughs> we, <laughs> Thank you, Bob. We can all <laughs> agree about that. And I mean, they've got these. So the NFBC has your four hour, your two hour, and your one hour drafts. And I I just will never do a four hour outside of TGFBI because you know, it's I'm on the turn. I was lucky enough to get the first pick, but that means I'm on the clock once a day. Yeah. And that's just, you know, that's not drafting. That's, that's so, not fun for anyone. You no, know, if you're only getting two rounds a day, uh you know, it's just not ideal. So I've been doing more of the two hour slow drafts. I did do a one hour. That one's tough because you got a one hour meeting, you go on the clock, you're you're risking it a little bit. But I think two is that sweet spot. I think two is two is where it's at. I, I even suggested to uh, Jason that you should sign up like they they should have speed, like a speed TTJ FBI. And you can just like you're like, I'm opting into the two hour draft. So like every like you. Put all the people that want a two-hour draft in one league. I don't know if that's even possible, but in general, I feel like we can get we can get it to two hours. I think or, more people for two than not. Yes, I agree. Or like if you even want to do like a live draft, like take the two hours and fly through it and get it done with like a normal live draft, like that would be. I'm down for that too because that would. Be I'm crazy. with Bob here. I, I used to think like slow drafts, like oh, it's it's so fun. You get to like drag out this long thing, and now I'm like, no, nah, I want this. I get like annoyed at how long I have to wait sometimes for this stuff. It's like, I, like, is this guy gonna fall to me? I'm not sure. It's, but we it's won't know until fun though. Might be half a day till you find out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It might be a different day. <laughs> so I started off 13 pick. I went Otani. And then I got Alvarez, Jordan Alvarez, Josh Hader, Adley Rushman, Framber Valdez, Brian Reynolds. I know me and Nick talked a little bit off air. The first five rounds, we were trying to go three bats, two pitchers. TGFBI is weird though because not no other league am I take why you know a closer in the third round like that's just not something I'm standardly doing. Yeah. But same with it's a two catcher league, so I followed that back up with the Rushman. I'm not taking a catcher normally in a fourth round. Um, there's just very weird nuances, I feel like, with TGFBI, because everyone tries to, like, make sure that you have the 10 categories. Um, that's where I am. I, my first picture was a closer, which that's not right. something I normally do. And I, I don't think – I mean, I think this is the spot to do it. I do think we get thrown off a little bit with ADP because – 
people are drafting for 50 round draft and hold leagues and you can't uh that's what drives the adp early in the off season and then you train your brain to say this is when this is the round that player is going in where i think it can fall a little bit more in the later drafts when you have the ability to pick up saves off the wire there might not be a ton but at least you've got that fallback so you know granted i have two closers through nine rounds but i like the value on them um and i waited i didn't take one until the seventh round um but i think that that pushes it up and it kind of skews you know what we're thinking going into a draft a little bit but the catcher one is where a more apt to to put to push a scarce resource up because it doesn't happen until you wait on catcher and you do it a couple times where you're just like, oh, I'm not taking these catchers here. This is the better player. But then eventually you see how your roster builds and you end up with Connor a couple Wong. $1 catchers. Connor Wong, great example. <laughs> um, yeah, when, when that when that falls off, it, it's a steep fall with catcher. And it's actually it, – the catchers are better this year than they have been the last few years. I'm comfortable with, like, 16 to 18 of them, but that still only means in a 15-team league that, like, three or four teams are really happy with their two catchers. So um, with Fab, I'm probably going to push catchers more than I am closers. Yeah, I typically I this is not unfortunately this is not my only two catcher league. I have a dynasty league that still does two catcher leagues for whatever reason. I've tried many a times to get rid of the two catchers. It's like literally the epitome of just absolute dog shit uh, <laughs> fantasy. But um, my general, I'll just go for like a stud, and then it's like the stud, uh, like stars and scrubs for the catcher position. Like one, like solid, and then just punt that second catcher because. It's literally like the tight end of a fantasy baseball. Yeah, it's true. I don't mind tight ends. Kicker. Well, yeah. Well, well, tight end falls off too, though. I get your point. I mean, yeah. if there's six yeah. okay. great That's... ones that are a tier above everybody else, the difference between taking your Kelsey or Andrews in the first, second round compared to once you wait, it's like, well, whatever. I'll just wait till round 10 yeah. if I don't get one. <laughs> yeah. So I see your point. I got you. When uh, drafting, do you are you like Nick, and do you tend to to um, lean towards the Sox uh, fandom if you have the option? Like, are you targeting uh, Cassis or a uh, or a Tyler O'Neill? Uh, I am targeting Cassis because I think he's going to be a monster, um, but it's not because he's a Red Sox. In fact, right now I'm staying away from, especially the pitchers. Uh, you're not going to see me taking Nick Pavetta in round 12. I know who Nick Pavetta is. I know who <laughs> Lucas Giolito is. Mm -hmm. I don't want any of those guys. I might take Bayo. Um, I mean, if, if you're talking about Cassis, though, I mean, he's going past pick 100. And in the second half last year, he had 309 with 15 homers and 38 RBIs. So good. An OBP of 412. That's nuts. And, you know, sure, you can't multiply it for the whole season, but can you? Because he was a rookie. I'm more apt to look at the, the second half that he had after he made some adjustments. He struck out way more than he ever did in the minors in the first half. So I, I think he's a big value past pick 100, and he could easily be a top five first baseman this year. Um, but, no, I've gotten to a point where, I, when I had uh, when I was younger, I did that stuff, and then I was like, "But that's not going to make me money. I'm still going to root for these guys, but uh, I'm going to take the better player ninety percent of the time. Maybe I'll use it as a tiebreaker." There you go. That's right. That's what I think. That's I think that's what Nick does too. I, we actually had this discussion earlier. I was almost going to take Goldschmidt at first, but then me and Nick were talking, and I'm like, maybe I'll just come back in like a round or two and get uh, Cassis, and that's so why I passed on Goldschmidt. Yeah, I mean, I, like, and it's similar And that I think Goldschmidt's a good value, too. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, I think he's been doing driveline type of thing, and it's just, I'm going to buy that type of player off of the down year. He contributes some speed. He should have a good average. You know, mm -hmm. He should be somewhere, I don't have him in front of me, but. Um, it was the sixth round is when I was going to take him. Oh, he was, yeah. um. He hit, yeah, he hit 266 or 268 last year. And before that, it was 317, 294, 304. He should hit 280 and, um, you know, contribute 
in every category, and he gives you some speed. He'll give you 10 steals, which that's what Freddie Freeman's been doing too. And I don't think we should expect 20 from Freeman anymore, but these first basemen who are just late in their career throwing 10 steals in, that's a nice addition to it. Yeah, and then another player that with that same thing is, uh, I mean, I guess he's more of an outfielder, but Cody Bellinger, 20 stolen bases last year, also can qualify for first base, I believe. So to get guys that are first base that are getting stolen bases is is actually almost unheard of. So I get like even just 10 from Goldschmidt. The reason I didn't go with Goldschmidt is we start five outfielders in TGFBI. So I went with uh, Brian Reynolds over Goldschmidt just for the sheer fact that yeah. when you when it, you know I kind of pushed that that uh, positional need ahead of a best player available maybe. And you said that you had taken Jordan before that. Yep. Was yep. that okay? Yep. Those are my so, two outfielders right now. And now you can wait for a little bit. And Reynolds is safe in you know four categories. Like he's just going to give you solid counting stats. But you can wait on outfield a little bit now that you have two, and go attack catcher and middle infield um and then i kind of found find that it comes back around where you can get the brandon nimmo types in around 14 um and always keep your fifth outfielder open in that type of league because it's like i took alex verdugo at pick 350 today and i don't know what it was around 23 24 and it's like he's been Great going value. under all these <laughs> other years and I don't know what the difference is, and he's playing in a better park. I don't think he's going to go hit 30 bombs there, but maybe he hits 18 instead of 13 in Yankee Stadium. Um, and he's going to give you the average and decent runs, decent RBIs in a good lineup. And he's just falling. And I think that you usually, like, I would leave that fifth outfielder spot open, especially you think you said you had Otani, so you got utility yep. blocked. You know, you can, you can get a late value there now that you have two. Yeah, same. I agree. I, the, it's kind of waiting on that and starting pitching. I only have one starting pitcher so far through six rounds. But have you ever heard of the Zanaboni method? <laughs> I've seen it in action. Uh, not as much this year. Is this just <laughs> the, the hitter heavy situation? Hitter heavy. Yeah. yeah. So as you're unfamiliar, um, Nick last year in TGFBI waited till I think the tenth round. It was tenth. Nick, all right. I need I need to come clean here. Last year it made sense. The no, I like I, I was getting like a Pablo Lo, Lopez in the tenth, eleventh round. There was right. not that, like that value was too good then. But now that tier of pitcher is just going so much earlier <laughs> because there's only two elite starters in the, that that are going in the first round, being Strider and Cole. Yeah. So now. I just feel like people are panicking on pitchers, so they're picking them a little bit early. So this year, I don't think the zero pitcher works. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in fairness, I told you I thought you were out of your mind, and you told me you were going to do that, and you did it anyway. So you stuck to yeah, your guns. Yeah. I stuck and, to my guns. And I give you credit for that. And frankly, um, you and I were drafted on the same end of the drafts in Nerf this year. I feel yep. like we have to tell this story. Yep. Oh, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Let's get into the Nerf. We get to pick 14, and there's a few guys that I want, but but I want – I'm considering Garrett Cole at that point. But I also see that there's two speed guys left, Jose Ramirez and Trey Turner. I like Ramirez more than Turner, but my fear is that if I take Cole and Nick is – loving bats as we know mm -hmm. he's gonna take he's gonna go wild card and he's gonna go ramirez and trey turner get the third the short get all the speed and i'm gonna be screwed after that so i took j ram and nick goes matt olson garrett cole on the turn i even waited because i knew you knew i was gonna go <laughs> so i was like I'm gonna but you did it to mess with course. me you took cole second yes Oh, that is that's cold Mine blooded. Did. I didn't know that till now. I wouldn't yeah. have joined today. Yeah. <laughs> no, Yo. that was something. So I was Bryce scared. Harper, which I like. There were, you know, I was interested in Ramirez, Cole Harper, with kind of Trey Turner as a fallback if Ramirez had gone. So it was fine, and I'm a little light on pitching, but so for know. those for those that are unfamiliar. Um, Quick recap of what exactly Nerf is. I know it stands for Northeast Regional uh, Roto Fantasy, right? There's like yeah, regionals. I Roto. I don't. Even Roto. Know. Okay. Yeah, I, I I probably should know that. 
but it's but part of the it, um, leagues, right? Yes. There's 11 different leagues that are all regional um, that come together for an overall prize. And is it, what's the format? It's uh same thing, Roto. So it's like, but is it same standard five as TGFBI, like average and yeah, two catchers, exactly one catcher? Same. Exactly the same. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And I, like Bob was saying, I waited on catcher and I ended up getting um, Diaz from the Rockies, which I don't hate actually. Like he's like a, he's not obviously a top 12 catcher, but he's fine to live with. And then I had to, and then I had to pick Connor Wong. But my third catcher is someone that I'm extremely excited about. And I'm trying to get him everywhere where I can. And Better not I say think, Connor Wong. It is not Connor Wong. Okay. It's the backup catcher <laughs> for the St. Louis Cardinals, Mr. Ivan Herrera. Yeah. Yep. Herrera or Herrera. I don't know. He's hitting the shit out of the ball. And I think they're just going to find a reason to put him in the lineup. So I'm really just banking on that instead of playing Connor Wong every week. Herrera is going to be your number two catcher. Yes. I can tell you right yes. now. Um, and it sounds like he's going to play half the time and Contreras is going to DH. Um, that was a sneaky pick right there. I wouldn't say the Connor Wong one was. No, um, your fucking but, second catcher was a sneaky pick, Bob. And we're not going to mention it. Jason knows, but I don't, I, I don't want this out in the universe. Oh, I can't talk about no, it. Let's talk. Go. Talk about it. Talk about it. <laughs> There's a ton of people talking about this. It wasn't that sneaky. No, I took Will Smith at the end of the fifth, and then okay. I took um, Henry Davis in round 17, mm -hmm. who's an outfielder right now, and catches were flying off the board, and it was just like I missed that cliff in round 10 and 11. I was like, whatever, I'm just gonna wait. Um, so I took Davis in round 17 with the hope that he's going to. You should, I mean, it's 10 games. So the third week of the season, you should have catcher eligibility. I can slide him over there. In the meantime, I have Travis Darno, who I took in like the last round just mm -hmm. to have someone in that spot. You had to fill the roster, and Davis doesn't have that eligibility yet. But uh, I don't know, round 17, I think that that's a decent spot for a second He's catcher. So, um, so we, yeah, we, I, we got away with it, Nick. We both waited, and hopefully we got away with it. Yeah, Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. yeah, Nick Nick put me on to the Henry Davis because I had not read the news the articles that he they are planning on moving him back behind the plate after giving him the bulk of outfield work last year. Um, so that yeah, that's that's obviously a, a nice little little tip of the hat there for anyone out there listening looking for a catcher league a sleeper. Uh, Henry Davis should eventually get catcher eligibility. It's in the first like two weeks of the season, depending on depending on your league settings. Um, I know some leagues are at like 20% games played or something like that. But, um, yeah, he will eventually get that uh, catcher eligibility back. The Pirates do plan on putting him back behind the plate. So a little sneaky tip there for you guys out there. And even, in a, even in a one-catcher league, right? Like you can even – he's got the, the offensive prowess to even put up uh, good numbers for a catcher. So if you're in a one-catcher league even, you want to – you know, you miss a catcher run or something like that, you can always grab him super late. I don't know. I mean, I have the ADP up here real quick. I can tell you what his ADP is. It's got you said it was late, right? You got him in there for late. I am around 17. Yeah, 15 team yeah. league. So 307. 307 right now is his current yeah. ADP on uh NFBC. So um super, super nice uh ADP there for Henry Davis. Good value, Bob. <laughs> I, got another, I got another question about the Nerf League. Uh, more specifically, the can you give us a review on the Sam and Caesar salad at uh, Luke and Joe's or Joe and Luke's? It's Jake and Joe's. Jake and Joe's. You got the Caesar salad this time. It, so, okay. <laughs> this was my first year being there. Well, this is my first year in the league, actually. Oh, okay. Um, first year in person. And I, I said to Nick, what are we going with for food? And he had told me the Caesar salad was good. I mean, this is a a buffalo wings tower type of place this is this is just the epitome of wings and beer yeah and he's a he tells me that the caesar salad is good <laughs> which is just that's not what i need it, it was a shout out john luke sunday <laughs> jake and joe's aka jake and Joe's. Joe's. <laughs> It's a Sunday night fantasy baseball draft, and this guy's trying to sell me on a Caesar salad. <laughs> Give me a break with salmon, Bob. With yeah, salmon. I don't yeah. care. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the that was one of the takeaways I got from Nick last year was yeah uh, the Caesar the salmon Caesar salad was the highlight of his draft last year. Yeah, because Jake fucked me in it. 
<laughs> it's still, oh. it's wow, still... tell us more about that. <laughs> yeah. So, I went to the bed. No, I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> Logan, oh, oh, Hoppy, like right before me, and I was ready to pick him. And instead, I picked Anthony Volpe, which actually, like, it made, like, it, it worked out. But yeah. in the yeah. moment, I was upset because he was like, I was like, okay, I'm going to get this catcher. He should do well. And I'm struggling at catcher because I always forget about catcher. So I was excited about it. Yeah. And then he just does it, and then he does a little, little Jake smirk. And then I said, oh, you little bitch. So, yeah. <laughs> Because that's like, the worst part. It, like, I, he was right before me last last year, and you were right before me this year. So I was like, yeah. the only time, the only two times I'm here, like two people that I know like well are right in front of me. What are the odds of that? Uh, yeah, that is that was strange. I think the other one, and we can be quick with this one, but the other turn where we had four guys in our queue, and oh. if you had taken these two, I would have taken the other two, and um. The outfielders were Nimmo and Quan, and the corn, the first baseman or corners, I guess. Uh, you took Muncie, and I took Reese Hoskins coming back, but I took Nimmo and and you took Quan, and I was debating between all four of those guys on that turn. Um, so it ended up working out fine, but we could have ended up with the, it's opposite the same exact players. players, just in different uniforms. <laughs> but that's kind of my point, Jason. Is like I don't know if you got a Nimmo, Stephen Quan turn. Um, they both have good. Oh, Quan has great batting averages, right? Quan mm -hmm. runs more. Nimmo will give you the twenty homers and the runs and the RBI, and Quan will score a hundred runs. And those are players that I find myself getting in rounds thirteen, fourteen of these drafts that are great third and fourth outfielders. That you know, it, it you do have to fill five, and you know that the top tier falls off. But there's a lot of solid guys that you know are going to get playing time. Um, and you know, you, you pick your spots to take the, take the risks, but those are, you know, Nimmo is, he's been on the field two years in a row now, like 600 plus plate appearances and kind of shedding that injury prone tag. And I think he's a good target around there. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I've Nimmo has been one of those guys that I've, um, been looking at, like, a, like you said, like a fourth outfield, fifth outfield. Um, he just like, is, is very undervalued. Um, I think, you know, especially for OEP leagues, he's huge. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, he's got a 189 ADP right now. So I mean, it, yeah. it's it's almost uh, almost free depending on what size league you're in. OVP is closer to like 100 because he's I'm just. Sure, yeah. he's, he's I, well, I, I don't know, but I'm just thinking that's probably closer to where I take him in that format. Um, Jung Hoo Lee, that's I'm I'm obsessed. But can you please just look oh. up his ADP because he's another guy that that fourth fifth outfield type that is just. Like 270. Like I would rather yeah. him there than Nemo at one, whatever you just said. He like just like the same type of player again, yeah. less less of like a known quantity, so it is a gamble. But being that late in the draft, I feel like the value's there. I, I see what you're saying there. I and and I think where you got him, because you took him in that draft, right? I it did. was right after I took I Davis, so it was the same spot to yeah, 50 to 270 range. Yeah. Um, I think that's where you should go. I think it was a great spot to grab him. But um, I don't know. I mean, I know what I'm getting from Nimmo. I don't necessarily know what I'm getting from Lee, even though I think he's going in a great spot. So For sure, yes. Um, but, you know, and I think that part of it, when he went to San Francisco, people were like, well, that's a, a shitty landing spot for him. But, you know, if he's going to be on base, if he's going to be scoring runs, he should be in the top half of the lineup. It's a decent team. You know, I think people forgot about him a little bit. Yeah, I agree. And I'm also in just speaking of that in that out outfield, uh, Matos, another guy that like I think could really outperform. I don't even know where he's being like if he's even being picked in these leagues, but just like such a yeah, decent reserve. Guy. Yeah. Like I think he's good enough. To actually play, if that makes maybe maybe more so in like a daily league, unlike these types of leagues. But in like a daily league, he's someone that I'm definitely looking to have, especially on like a deep level. Five ninety three yes. for Matos. Yeah, right. And Three. I think recently he might go in like the reserve rounds, but he's post hype. You know, he was yeah. supposed to. Well, he, he was ranked at times as a top prospect, 
He came up, he didn't do a ton, but he came up at 21, 22 years old. And, you know, every now and then you see, I don't know if you guys look at the baseball forecaster, but they'll put like the, you know, the up arrow next to people, like if everything comes together. Mm -hmm. And Matos has an upside of, it says 280 batting average, 40 stolen bases. Like if everything came together, like that's in his game. Are they predicting that? No. But if you're in your reserves, I don't know why you wouldn't take a flyer on him, especially if you're short on speed. You know, Willie Castro is another guy that I find that I'm getting in this close to the reserves, maybe the late active rounds, because he's got that third base and outfield eligibility. He doesn't have a starting spot, but he should get in the lineup four or five days a week. Um, you got to take one or two of those flyers late in the draft just to to see if it takes off and you get that John Birdie type of player. And then if they don't, you just cut them. <laughs> hey, you got someone to cut. Yeah. It's a great You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, I guess again, it is draft season. Is there like um, maybe some guys that you find yourself like, I need to have this guy on my team. I'm leaving this draft with this guy. Obviously, we know about all the, the you know the real top end players, but other guys like in the middle end rounds, we kind of talk a little bit here with some few of them, like with the you know Willie Castro, Henry Davis, things like that. But are there some other names out there that uh, you're you know making sure you leave every draft with? Yeah, so I uh, I threw all of my drafts, and that includes best ball. So it, it's not not like everything is. Uh, How many drafts, Bob? Oh, <laughs> don't put them on the spot like that. Don't. Don't, uh, so, don't expose him. So the problem is that I do these $10 best ball drafts in like December because mm-hmm. it helps um, give me familiarity with the draft pool. So I look at them as like mock drafts, but I figure if you do a $10 league, people aren't going to just go on auto draft. If there's some, yep. some cash that's in there, sure. people actually draft their teams. And I do that throughout like December and January, just so that I don't jump into those big money leagues and, <laughs> you know, go crazy too early but it gets me noticing like all right you know this position is scarce or whatever else so i think i did like eight best balls and i probably had six real drafts since that um so i've taken the the two that i have the most of are cade horton of the cubs and brandon marsh of the phillies and i know that marsh has uh, a bit of i think he had a minor knee procedure and they're hoping he's ready for opening day but I take Marsh as my fifth outfielder a lot. And I think that for some reason, even though he made improvements last year, he's hitting better against left-handed pitching. Uh, he was playing more often. He's kind of his strong side platoon, but he ends up playing 80% of the time. And he was going lower than he was a year ago. And I feel like he's maybe not a breakout player, but he's on that verge of just being someone that, that you want to have in your lineup. And he's going past pick 300. So I like Marsh. Cade Horton is just, he's the last couple of rounds flyer. And I was taking him in the best balls because I think that he'll get 15 to 20 starts with the Cubs when all is said and done. Um, You know, he won't be up early in the season. So if it's a, if you just got a short bench, it might not be the best stash, but he was good for best ball. Um, Sal Perez at catcher. I just, he's after that first tier, but I know he's going to get the playing time. And for me, uh, plate appearances for catchers in the Roto Leagues are important, so I've been taking Perez a little bit. Um, Edwin Diaz I have in four leagues. I actually have him as my top reliever. I know he's not going there, but he didn't have an arm injury. He had a leg injury. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that he's elite. I think if he strikes out 100 guys, he can have an ERA under three, even if it's not – 50 saves because he's on the Mets. I just, I really trust Diaz and it's not an arm injury that he's coming off of. So I think he's being dinged a little too much to be like the third or fourth closer off the board. Um, We want like two or three more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've been taking some Cade Cavalli on the Nationals uh, for like draft and hold because I think he's due back in like June or July. Yep. And it's Washington. They're not going anywhere. They're going to throw him out there, and he should get 15 to 20 starts, and he's just kind of like a prospect pedigree guy that is going way too late in those 50-round formats. Um, one or two others. Will Benson. I love Will Benson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's going late, and that's another one from that outfield group and why I think it's okay to take yeah. too early and then take your three other three later. Will Benson's another one. Um, he looks good in the spring. 
he had a great second half um, where he emerged with power and speed. You know, he might hit for a low batting average, so you got to account for that a little bit. Mm-hmm. But everyone's going to have a flaw at the point of the draft that Will Benson's going. So that's another one I've taken three or four teams. Love that. I, I'm i not in as many drafts as I would like to be. So I think next year I'm going to go with your approach of the – because like, like you said, these mocks that we do do they are so tough to like – monitor because like like you said people don't care after like the first like eight rounds and even like we were all just in a mock and i felt like there were literally people in the chat being like i'm done with this like (laughs) yeah and then i was thinking of ways to fix a mock and it's like what if we just draft it put five bucks in each and then just run it through like a simulation and see what team fucking wins like just to because it's on fan tracks and it's going to run the the free league anyways yeah. and just see who ends up winning and got the most at bats and innings at the end of the year. Yeah. And like you got like a case of beers, like just anything to make mocks actually work because the idea of mocks are great, but there's just so many ways like in, in like someone times out and injured player is the top guy in the queue. So he gets picked in like the fourth round. Yeah. You're like, okay, Can't well, force people to care round. more than they do. Exactly. So I love the idea. Do you use underdog for that or? Um... No, I use fan tracks and they start oh. running $10 best balls in November. Okay. Um, All right. I, I well, think I was like, I got to get past Thanksgiving and then I'll start after that this year. Yeah. I really, really like that idea because knowing patient, the pool but... means so much. And I feel like you yes. get better. You, you become a better drafter throughout each draft. So like right. the mistakes that you make on that first I'll like, go back okay. and look at my first best ball uh, late in the year. And I'll be like, geez, I didn't know what the hell I was doing at that point. So yeah, uh, it's just so in- like, I, I'm so curious to where like Blake Snell went in that draft, like the ones from November or like Cody Bellinger, like those guys that, I mean, I know Bellinger you know was falling a ton early was Vlad. Like he was going around yes. four and five because people were probably pissed at him. But and then the projections started coming out and it was like, wait a minute, you he's know, he good. should bounce back. He's 26 years old or whatever. I don't even know if he's that old, but um, so I think that, that it was just like fresh that Vlad was coming off a down year and he was like, all right, I'll take him in round five, you know? Yeah. I, I really like that. So thank you for giving me a new tool in my toolbox. There we go. <laughs> All right. A couple more questions here for you before we get out of here. I want to kind of maybe throw out some ADP, maybe some shocking ADPs. And we can kind of talk about them, talk through some of these with, with you and see what you think. Um, I think one of the big names right now, probably the biggest ADP riser or maybe inflated ADP is uh, Ellie De La Cruz. Um, currently going at pick 23. So depending on what size league you're in, that's, that's either the end or the beginning of the second round. Um, that's, that seems to me like a very, very high um, spot to be picking him. Now, the upside is there. I'm not going to say that the upside of Elliday Cruz is not there. Um, but in a league like TGFBI or Nerf, where it's batting average, I think – you might find a little bit better value on someone like at that high. Again, multi-position eligible, that helps. But when I look at LED Cruz, I think me and Nick can talk about this too. There's another Cruz that has kind of that similar profile, power, speed, maybe a little bit better average that's going almost 50 picks later, and that's O'Neill Cruz. Um, I feel like, in my eyes, I'd rather wait a few extra rounds and maybe target somebody like an O'Neill Cruz over Elliot. What do you think? Um, what are your thoughts on Elliot Day Cruz going in the second round of, of drafts nowadays? Yeah, so he, he's not for me, but I also, well, first of all, if you are anti Ellie, just don't put it on Twitter because you'll have like, <laughs> you'll be at the stake in no time. Yeah. After what, when Derek Hardy came out with his projections and people were pissed. Um, so, you know, but with, with De La Cruz, it's just not how I really build my teams with what could be that level of downside. And I know that the upside is like, I'm well aware of what that is, of where he could end up, that he could steal 70 bases. He would be so much fun to watch as a Reds, Reds fan. I mean, that's a team that I'll, the baseball package last year, I was watching a lot in the second half and will continue this year. Cause God forbid I watch the Red Sox right now, but like, 
down the stretch, like if I would, I just ran August 16th on, cause I can't remember what the date was from August 16th on last year, Ellie De La Cruz hit 186 and he had a 33% strikeout rate. And I'm not saying he's going to do that again this year, but that exists. That's there. That happened for the last six, seven weeks of the season. I mean, that's 166 plate appearance sample size. His WRC plus was 63 during that time. And I don't think he's going to get sent down, but I also just think that it might take some time. You know, there's a, a possibility that he has a rough start like that, or he's striking out a ton and we'll see more highlights of him on Twitter than anything. And he'll definitely be out there stealing bases, but I don't want to tank my average. And I feel like there's a risk of that early. I'm, I'm trying to protect it with your, Freddie Freeman's the obvious name, but Bo Bichette is going in round three. And that's another name that I just feel like is a good building block for a Roto team where I'll try to piece together the steals that I don't get from Ellie. And I think O'Neill Cruz is a good name. You know, he was going earlier last year. Of course, who knows? He's got a year off. Um, what kind what, what he's going to look like on the other side of that? Will it take a month or so? But, and that's a good name a, a example that's going like probably round six that you can get O'Neill Cruz. Yeah, and even further, a name we brought up earlier, Anthony Volpe, right? The power maybe not quite as big as Elliot Cruz, but the stolen bases are there. The average is probably similar, maybe a little bit higher with Volpe. And he's going to uh, 134 is his ADP. So, I mean, for people that are, you know, reaching on Elliot Cruz, it, it's it's just shocking to me. Like, um, yeah, again, second round right now. So that's where you can expect to – he will not get past second round. I can guarantee it in uh, any league that you're in. It's just so hard, especially like I find these drafts being hard because I the only way I've played fantasy baseball is dynasty. So like I got into it like four years, no, probably more than four, like five, six years, years ago. And I only played dynasty. So like if I hear these names, I'm like, 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 a, like a Goldschmidt. I'm like, no, he's old because I have that like filter of like a dynasty, like thought of, of, of a value of a player. But like. It's the opposite with Ellie. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I get it. He's Ellie De La Cruz. He's, he could be very good for the next 15 years. But, like, right now, I don't know. Like, it's just – it's too unknown. The For the first three, four, five rounds, you need to just pick people that won't make you lose. And I think if you pick Ellie in the second round, he very well might win you something. But I think it's more likely that he'll lose you something. Yeah. And if you, I don't think that you can't, like, even if he's that player that he was down the stretch last year, you just got to build safely around that. JC mentioned Brian Reynolds earlier. Um, hey, Oscar Hernandez is someone in like round 10. George Springer, when he's on the field, um, those are outfielders that I feel like you can kind of, like, all right, they're going to get safe counting stats with a decent batting average. And you have to do that through like round 10 to 12. Um, you know, especially if you're going to mix in closer and catcher, you only have so many spots to make the safe pick. You just got to be aware of that. If you take Ellie in the late second, um, what you're pairing it with. And I'm not a huge projections guy, but I like to take um, in a slow draft. If I have the time to do it, I like to, plug those projections in and see what I'm tracking towards what categories. If I combine the six hitters that I have so far, what's my batting average projected to be? Because I think it can tell you, all right, you know, I'm lacking a little bit here, or I have too much power and I'm short on steals. I think just, you know, don't live by the projections, but it helps tell you where you might be uh, short on your team. Yeah, for sure. Um, one more name that I think is kind of I thought was kind of shocking to me. I, again, this is a batting average leagues. Um, Kyle Schwarber has an ADP right now of eighty three. So within the first six rounds, yes, the power is there, but similar to my, the aspects what I was talking about with Ellie De Cruz, this is a guy that didn't even hit over two hundred last year. We're kind of going down that line of I mean, he's literally becoming Adam Dunn at this moment. Um, again, forty five plus home runs last two seasons, so the power is real. But I think just Someone that maybe I saw was going through the ADPs here. Obviously, the power's not quite as good, but it's slightly on par. And that's Jorge Soler right now. Obviously, just signed with a, in a bad ballpark for power. But at 153, he's a guy that's averaged 
37 home runs in his last three full seasons, taking away the last injury season of last year, uh, 2021 or 2022, sorry. Um, 37 home runs on average. And you're talking 90 picks later. Um, I just, I think, you know, I have, I have a, I have a sweet spot for sure, but I'm obviously a, a, a Cubs fan, but when it comes to fantasy, that just seems way too high of a price tag for me for Schwarber. Um, I, I'd much rather pass on and get someone a little bit more safer as far as a five tool player or at least a four tool player um, in the six first six rounds. But that's just me. But um, that was one of the names that I thought kind of stuck out to me for a, uh, a crazy uh, inflated ADP. I think he's going later than he did a year ago, believe it or not. I feel like he was wow. round four, um, but he also had hit. 218 the year before and he <laughs> stole 10 bases so something yeah. about the one at the start of the batting average i think really just rubs people the wrong way understandably yeah. but just seeing that 197 yeah i think i still think that he's like a 230 hitter and i'm there's more of a chance i'll take schwarber than ellie but it depends on who i've taken before that if i've got two or three hitters that i think can hit 300 and Schwarber, you know, I'm on that turn at the end of the sixth or something like that. And I can pair it with something or take Stephen Kwan later, Luis Arias later. Like you're going to have to make, you're going to have to have a safe batting average floor and then not take any other risks after that for mm-hmm. batting average. But I don't know, man. It's like 47 and 104 with 108 runs. That yep. can win you three categories. So it's all about what have you done before that? If you're going to go with Schwarber, whereas if you take Ellie, we've only had one pick before that. And, you know, you don't really know how the rest of the draft is going to unfold. So. Yeah. I mean, when you compare Ellie to Schwarber, I would much rather take Schwarber in the sixth than Ellie in the second. But yeah. Um, yeah it, I thought that that was kind of shocking to me to see Schwarber in the first sixth round. That's kind of even shocking to hear that he was even in the fourth round in 2023. Yeah. So um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of crazy. One more real quick one here before we get out of here, and that's just uh, this one was like talking to me. Um, Cole Reagans, um, love the profile. He just went 61st overall in my TGFBI league, oh. um, <laughs> which is actually insane. Even it's that's shocking. He also has a, an ADP of 110 on NFBC, NFB, which I also think is kind of shocking. He's going right behind Joe Musgrove. Now, Cole Reagans had a great year last year, huge breakout potential this year. Um, but, yeah, 61 is is a little shocking to me. Um, he's someone that I think is going to, re- you know, see his ADP rise even more as maybe some of these drafts go on. But at that price tag, I am out. I talked about Cole Reagans, I think, I don't know, a couple episodes ago, Nick. He was one of my uh, breakout, you know, players for this year. Um, but I'm at that price tag. It's even even at 110, that's a little high for me. Um, he's going ahead of Dylan Cease currently on NFBC, um, which again, you you talk about wins league. He's on the Royals. The wins aren't going to be readily available. Neither is Cease with the Sox. But I think those that's just it seems very inflated to me right now. Well, you can't fifth round, and that's why you can't overreact to spring training news. Yeah. Somebody saw that he's throwing 101 miles an hour. For me, I'd rather Reagan's be throwing like 97 because I know he can be a really good pitcher at 97. Once these guys start hitting a hundred consistently and he's already had Tommy John, like, I don't know. DeGrom had already yep. had Tommy John once and then he was hitting a hundred and he just couldn't stay on the field. So that's what my worry is. I was almost, I didn't want to see him at, and I have, I've been taking Reagans in that eighth round that you referenced mm-hmm. as my third starting pitcher. And I'm okay with that. I don't want him to be my two just because I think that there's too much injury risk there, but I okay. kind of believe in what he was doing down the stretch. If he can stay on the field and the, the strikeout upside is immense, Yep. but you know, like you said, there you can't have everything in the, when you're talking about pitchers in the eighth round and he's not going to win many games on that team, and he's an injury risk. So it's, again, what do you have before that? If I've got two starters that I trust uh, to, to throw decent innings, close to 200 innings, I'm okay taking a shot with him as my third guy, but not in the fifth round. Yep, I agree. Um, but I think, yeah, those are the, some of the shocking uh, ADPs that I saw just coming in here and talk about some draft strategies here and things like that. But other than that, 
why don't you, uh, you know, let the people know again one more time where they can find you. And uh, again, thanks for joining us. Yeah, definitely. I don't think I plugged the Twitter at the beginning. So that's at Bob Osgood 15. Um, my writing work is at overthemonster.com for the, the Red Sox. And uh, the Monsters of Sox podcast feed is where myself, uh, Jake Devereaux, and Keaton DeRocher, we record every week during the season uh, and quite a bit during the offseason, too. So our uh, select podcast within that feed is called The Red Seat. And uh, this was great. Uh, you know, happy to come on anytime and talk about this stuff with you guys because this is this is such a good time of year as we turn the calendar to March and uh, really get into draft season. Those of us who haven't been doing December best balls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Bob.